Thank you, Rusty. And uh, can you hear me in the back? Is that working okay? If you can't hear me, raise your hand. <laughs> Great. So let me start by thanking the Marine Technology Society, IEEE OES, for coordinating and continuing this important tradition of the Oceans Conferences. And let me give specific thanks to Rusty and Jim for your leadership with respect to this conference, and also thank Ray and Renee for your leadership. I have what I think is the rare honor of being able to say, I think, I am the only former president-elect of the Marine Technology <laughs> Society. And, and let me take uh, a, a personal minute to thank a few folks. I want to thank Drew Michelle and Ray Toll and Donna Kosak leadership of MTS for your rapid response when I had a very interesting choice to make. So having been elected the Marine Technology Society president a few years ago, immediately after that election, I got a very interesting phone call from a certain Dr. Catherine Sullivan. And Kathy, who is the administrator of NOAA, said that there was an opportunity to get a chief scientist at NOAA. Now, NOAA had not had a chief scientist for 18 years prior to that. The last chief scientist at NOAA was Kathy Sullivan. So when she said that I had the opportunity to get a presidential appointment to be the, the chief scientist at NOAA, and I had the recent election of uh, president of MTS, it's a very tough decision. And hopefully what I'll be able to do here today is to show you the kinds of things, knowing that we had a roughly two and a half year period left in this administration, the kinds of things that we could do through the office of the chief scientist at NOAA that are completely consistent with the missions of MTS and OES. And so I thought maybe we can, maybe I can have my cake and eat it too and try to work on some really critical issues. And that's why I am excited today, especially to be able to follow Dr. Gallaudet. You heard from the Admiral some extraordinary connections between marine technology capabilities and national security. What I'd like to weave into that discussion is a little bit, maybe a lot, of the element of how we can do the same thing for economic security throughout the world. And the idea there is that there is a potential new blue economy that this audience can help drive, that we can help define. So to set this up, let me put it in a little bit of historical context. Over 50 years ago, the National Academy of Sciences, the National Research Council, put out this report, Economic Benefits from Oceanographic Research. Now, recognize this was 50 years ago. So we were looking at the oceans as effectively as an infinite resource and that there were extractive opportunities. We could do more fishing, we could do more oil and gas, we could do more uh, aggregate extraction. And so there was this sense of the ocean as being something of a cash cow, if you will. And in fact, when you look at some of the quotes out of this particular report where we said that 50% improvement in the accuracy of long-range weather forecasting might well produce savings of $2 billion a year, that was prescient. That was looking to a future that very few people thought about. That was the, about the time when the commercial weather services industry was evolving. And some would argue we've far exceeded that $2 billion mark. And of course, the implication is that the improvements in long-range weather forecasting would depend critically on having ocean observations and ocean technology at the center of that capability. So now fast forward 50 years and consider how we look at the ocean. We talk about things like sustainability. We talk about ecosystem services. How much value is there in the ability of the ocean to serve as a sink for many of the pollutants? How much value is there in terms of the ocean to provide our oxygen that we, br uh, that we breathe? Ecosystem resilience. We talk about economic resilience as well. But the point is all of these studies that have been conducted, which are represented by the front pages on the left, lead us to believe that rather than a product-based economy, which will still continue to flourish, 
oil and gas fisheries aggregates. It's going to churn along at its own pace. Maybe there is an information-based economy that we can be developing around the oceans that is critically dependent on marine technology. And that's at the heart of this new blue economy. Now, the reason I characterize the new here is there's a lot of discussion about blue economy. If you Google blue economy, you will get several thousand different definitions. And I want to make sure as we proceed forward that you understand what I'm talking about is this information-based, revenue-generating kind of economy that's based on the capabilities for forecasting, for prediction, for now casting, for hind casting, for forensic applications. So how is this going to play out? Well, as a NOAA guy, I look at this as a critical component of what we call the environmental intelligence portfolio. So intelligence being the timely, accurate, reliable provision of information that can be used to do any number of things. You heard great examples from Admiral Gallaudet of the intelligence value for national security to give us that warfighting edge. And I would argue there is a similar component to intelligence that addresses the resilience in terms of social resilience, economic resilience, ecological resilience, and that there is a big business bottom line associated with this. You take that onion and peel it back the next layer, and what we're talking about is this kind of economic enterprise. And I credit Ralph Rayner, who's done a wonderful job in framing a lot of the thinking about the economic sectors and economic development. The providers are basically those who have the sensors, the platforms, the models that assimilate those data, that kick out the observations, kick out the data, kick out the initial forms of information. The intermediaries are those value-added service providers, the retailers, some might argue, of those products of the observations. So the intermediaries would be the ones that say, let me take something that's been produced at public ex expense, so the government provided products and services, add some value to that for a particular market of end users. So tailor that product that's been developed in a way that there may be a profit margin, there may be a clear element of resilience associated with it. That's how we're going to try to get to this new blue economy. And there's some key components to that. You've got to have the currency of the realm. The currency of the realm is the observations and the data that are being produced. And I would point out, take a look at an oceans conference from 20 years ago. Scan through that and look at what kind of sensors and platforms were being developed back then. And you get a real sense of how far we have come in terms of observational technology, in terms of sensors, in terms of platforms, in terms of our ability to monitor, that is to say, sustain observations. Just look at something like the Argo float system and conceive of how much information and data we're getting from a system like that. So we're well primed in terms of the observations. And I would argue, in fact, that a really good example, which many of you will are participating in and involved in and can hear more about if you don't know enough about IUS, the Integrated Ocean Observing System, we now have a capability we didn't have 20 years ago for operational observations being fed into the grand databases that we rely on. So let me go back and point out that's pretty much, a, I would argue, a well-in-hand enterprise. The parts that really need some clear work, and there's a lot of initial efforts in this, are the market analysis, the risk analysis associated with those markets, and then the investment. Don't count on the federal dollar to necessarily make that investment. But where are the investors? How do we get this community and this audience engaged with the venture capital, the angel investors, to start getting to where we need? Well, part of it is making the compelling case Analysis. Part of it is making the compelling argument that says this is where you're going to see a return on that particular investment. And in order to do that, we're going to have to demonstrate success thus far in how we've worked this emerging new blue economy. So 
I want to take a little bit of time and give you five case studies. And these case studies are specifically called out because they represent a pretty broad diversity of economic sectors, a pretty broad diversity of opportunities, a very broad diversity of data types, sensor types, observational types. And these are the kind of things where, again, one could argue, well, gee, my tax dollars are already going to support these things. Yep, they are. But not to the detail and tailored specificity that will be required by certain user communities. The analogy is commercial weather services. If you're running the New Jersey Department of Transportation and you want an accurate forecast of weather for mileposts 10 to 30 on the New Jersey Turnpike, you're not going to get that from the National Weather Service. And the United States Navy and United States Air Force are certainly not going to provide that for you. But you could start with those products coming from the National Weather Service and tailor it if you've got the intellectual foresight and insight to add value to existing products and provide that customer with some value add. And that actually happens. So companies like AccuWeather provide that kind of capability. We are on the cusp of the same sort of emergence for commercial ocean services. And hopefully, as I walk through these five case studies, you'll see how it works. And you'll get a sense of what the public-private partnership potential is for doing that. So let's talk about oil spill preparedness and response. And this is simply a statement of fact that as we are developing new capabilities, and I freely admit the slide on the right is a bit dated, but the fact of the matter is Shell has started drilling in the Arctic. Department of Interior decisions from earlier this week notwithstanding, what this shows you is that Shell has extensive lease holdings up in the Arctic, and so we need to be prepared for operations, drilling operations, and potential spill response. And that involves a whole array of products and services. So part of it is understanding the value of pre-spill monitoring. As we learned with Deepwater Horizon, there has to be good baseline information in order to assess downstream natural resource damage. But more importantly, many of you in the audience are working on a consulting basis to provide some of the kinds of products that are alluded to here. So regulatory compliance with respect to safety, with respect to operations. When you operate in the Arctic, for example, you have to have the best possible forecast of first ice occurrence in that area, in that lease site. How are you going to get that information? Well, you're going to start with the existing forecasts of that area for ice production. And then you're going to tailor it to the particular operations at that site. And even more specifically, you're going to tailor it to that particular geography. That's all part of the regulatory compliance. You're not even going to start operations up there until you can have that kind of information. And then, in terms of preparedness for response and restoration, you have to have the best forecast, dispersion, transport, forecasts surface, subsurface. You have to have a good characterization of what the ecosystem looks like, what the, what the faunal assemblages are. And the product then, as you can see, is, is just one example of a product is these highly resol resol resolved archived real-time observational data in KML format, for example. The public sector will not provide that kind of resolution and specificity required for a particular client, a particular community. How do we get to a place where we've built a robust capability in this area? Now, this isn't to say there isn't some of this going on already, but the opportunity is vast for even further development. And it's a real buyer's market in the sense that if I've got a better proprietary forecast system than you, I'm going to get the edge. I'm going to get the economic uh, benefit of being able to outcompete in this area. Let's talk about another example. This is one of my favorites as an Oregonian. This is one I'm very familiar with. So when you ship grain out of the Port of Portland, shown down here in the lower right, when you ship grain from Portland, uh, you end up shipping it all the way down the Columbia River 
Given the uh, ship speeds required to navigate the Columbia River, you have to ship over about, you have to transit over about a half of a tidal cycle. Now, Oregon also gets a lot of rain. So you've got tides, you've got rain, you've got all of the other conditions associated with uh, the geography of that area. You want to be able to load out that uh, ship to maximum extent so that you've optimized the underkeel clearance, so you don't ground the ship. You've optimized the air gap as you go under the bridges in Portland and downstream. You need a rather specific forecast system. Will the public sector provide forecasts of hydrology and tides? Of course. But you know, your ship isn't the same as the next guy's ship, and you're loading a different kind of product which may have a different value, so you want a tailored product. You want a product that says you can, lo you can load X tons of this kind of wheat at this time of day, and you better cash lines and start downstream at 0430 tomorrow morning. That's a tailored product that's going to depend on having these kinds of short-term coupled models, the riverine models, the coastal models, the hydrological models, but also some understanding of the characteristics of that particular transport system. And really what we're talking about oops, is the market opportunity associated with commodity-specific loadout and transit intelligence. Commodity-specific and transport-specific. There's another market. Let's talk about another form of hazard. And in this case, I'm going to try showing you the track of Superstorm Sandy. And I would point out as you watch this track, as the storm is forming down here off Florida, that's the projected track four days out. Now watch the storm form. FEMA had an 80% certainty forecast four days out. That's the product that is provided publicly. I would point out that in Superstorm Sandy, there was $60 billion worth of damage. 109 people lost their lives. That's horrible. Compare that with what happened seven years earlier with Katrina, where over 1,900 lives were lost. Now, it's not necessarily a fair comparison. Some of it reflects improvements in forecast. But a lot of it gets to the question of, are there economic opportunities? And obviously, the immediate economic opportunities here are with a good forecast, you can revector the commercial shipping, which actually happened in this case. As a NOAA guy, many of you have heard me say, and I'll say it again, we're very proud to have pointed out, look at the dates there. That's about the time that holiday shipping is happening to ports like New York and New Jersey. And because of the forecast uh, provided by the National Weather Service, uh, those commercial shippers, instead of going into New York, actually revectored up to Boston. So it's very clear that that time of year, in that particular year, NOAA saved Christmas. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> the, the point here, though, is that there's other aspects, other things that we learned from Superstorm Sandy, not unlike what we learned after the 2004 tsunami in the Indian Ocean. And, and the examples are that natural infrastructure or enhanced infrastructure actually can have a clear economic benefit. So architecture, consulting opportunities associated with site-specific ecosystem services valuation. Uh, there's, a, there's an activity called oyster texture in New York right now. And the idea is how, is, how can we enhance the natural wetlands, the marshlands, in a sustainable manner, in an ecologically sensitive manner, and actually provide enhanced protection against storm surge and superstorms and hurricanes. And what other forms of enhanced natural infrastructure, green infrastructure, if you will, might actually be developed? And now we start to get into some interesting questions about long-term climate effects and sea level rise which actually leads me to some other examples. 
in the Gulf Coast, in Lake Erie, off the Pacific Northwest, off Cape Cod, virtually everywhere in this country, in our coastline, we have problems with red tides, harmful algal blooms. Uh, they have considerable impacts on public health. Uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration has one fully operational harmful algal bloom forecast system that's in the Gulf of Mexico and the Eastern Gulf, uh, and now some more of the Northern Gulf. When we operationalized that, uh, it happened when I was the head of the National Ocean Service, and I remember we were thinking, boy, we're going to get a lot of grief from the local communities in Tampa, St. Pete, because basically what we're doing to an area that's so dependent on tourism and recreation is we're telling them we're going to give you a forecast when people are going to have a bad time. And I remember when I signed off on operationalizing this, the first thing I did was I asked our staff to go talk to the local public health communities and see what their take on this was. And the take was exactly the opposite. The local public health communities said, we would love if we had a two or three uh, day lead time on something like a harmful algal bloom that will cause respiratory problems because we can prepare in the hospitals for those kinds of admissions. And the local tourism group said, that would really be good, because you know what? Mom and dad and the kids generally tend to come down for vacation anyway, and if we can tell them, don't go to the beach on Thursday, you might want to go inland, it actually puts the tourism industry on better footing. Now, once again, the public service on this is one where we can provide a general forecast, but we're not going to tailor the forecast at NOAA for a particular recreational sector, necessarily, or for a particular uh, uh, geographic sector, a very narrowly focused geographic sector. And it may be that there are some derivatives of these products for public health, tourism, seafood safety, etc. And what it really depends on is having advanced coupled ecological and behavioral forecasts. I really appreciate Admiral Gallaudet's reference to the Earth System Prediction Capability, ESPC. And it's a wonderful dialogue between DOD, between Navy, Air Force, and NOAA, and NASA, and NSF. But here's the question. How do we take the primarily physically oriented concepts around the Earth system prediction and now couple in some of these critical ecological forecasts and capabilities and do it in a way where you can tailor a harmful algal bloom forecast system for the city of Toledo's water intake or water treatment facility, abundant opportunity for economic development. The last one is one that, for those of us who were down in Norfolk for oceans in 2013, 12, thank you, um, we can relate to. And there's been a lot of all of government work, and I really credit Ray Toll and his team for working hard on this activity. Nuisance flooding. Nuisance flooding is basically defined as flooding that's between one and two feet above uh, local high tide. By 2050, all projections indicate that major coastal cities in the United States will experience nuisance flooding on average 30 times per year. 30 times per year. So there's a lot of great work going on among the agencies in the federal government on long-term decadal projections and decadal outlooks on things like sea level rise, subsidence, what the impacts will be for applications like what you see here. So this is a general application. But what this doesn't do is it doesn't tell the local emergency manager or the local city planner what kind of infrastructure changes they may want to start building into their budgets right now. It's a decision tool, but not with the specificity that might be needed at that very, very local level. And consequently, there is a real opportunity for resilience planning and guidance and what it comes down to, and this is the holy grail with climate modeling, is downscaling things like sea level rise projections and also risk translation. So we're having a lot of discussion right now about bringing the social, behavioral, and economic sciences into this debate. A Little bit of a sidebar. We are very proud at NOAA of the fact that the average tornado warning has now gone up to about 12 to 15 minutes. That's really wonderful news. It's, a, it's an extraordinary example of good scientific research 
technology development, use of new radar technologies, for example. And, and I should point out that 20 years ago, about 20 years ago, the average warning lead time for tornadoes was minus five minutes. We could tell you you had just been hit by a tornado five minutes ago. <laughs> so the meteorologists and the technocrats in an agency like NOAA are fond of saying, and, and understandably saying, what if we could get that up to 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes? And we get all hot and bothered and moist about doing that. And then the social scientists and the behavioral scientists come in and they say, you know what? If you get that warning up to 30 or 40 minutes, you know what's going to happen? Mom is not going to take cover. Mom is going to say, ah, I got a half an hour. I'm going to go to the school and pick up the kids. Or somebody's going to say, I got 40 minutes. I can go to the store and get some milk and toilet paper. It's not necessarily the best solution. And without engaging the social, behavioral, and economic scientists, we're not going to get the adequate risk translation. So part of this new blue economy involves a different culture of how we work with communities. Just another slight sidebar here. There's a really rich opportunity here. Some of you may have seen that uh, our colleagues at the National Science Foundation, specifically in the social, behavioral, and economic sciences, are getting a lot of challenges from Capitol Hill about what's the value of what you're doing. Well, I just gave you an example. The problem is that most social, behavioral, and economic scientists work in different test areas. They work in the financial markets. They work in public health. So part of this is how do we, as a community, engage the social, behavioral, and economic sciences community to come in and join us? Because many of the exciting social sciences research problems are just as relevant to the environment as they are to, say, public health. So there's a rich opportunity here for developing new products and services, enabled by these kinds of challenges, but also enabled by the technology uh, developments we see. And you heard some of these from the Admiral just before me, but I want to repeat a few general categories. So obviously, this whole portable devices and communications technology is a rich area for us. And I would point out that just two weeks ago, uh, the president issued a, an executive order, a proclamation regarding citizen science. Now, citizen science, many of us think of as, gee, that's kind of cute. Uncle Fred can go out and take a weather measurement. Citizen science is taking a critical role in a lot of what we do. Citizen science, for example, is taking advantage of the fact that each one of us has a pretty good magnetometer in our pocket, if you've ever used the compass on your iPhone or Android phone, you've got a magnetometer. If you now have 100 million people with that magnetometer, you can start doing some interesting geophysical work on geomagnetics. You can see where this is going. We've worked at NOAA in developing a number of apps. MPing, just out of curiosity, does anybody have MPing on your phone? Please, load up MPing. It is an app that simply says, when you pull it up, it's raining here, it's snowing here, there's sleet where I am, and that's it. But if you've now got tens of millions of people doing that, you have a built-in citizen science validation for the weather forecast system. So portable devices and communications are more than just receivers. They're actually providers of data and information. And, and the accuracy issue is actually resolved by the wisdom of the crowd, if you will. That, yes, the magnetometer on my cell phone is probably 1% to 2% accurate. That, oven by itself, is not good enough. But when I've got 10 million people providing those data, we start getting some really meaningful input into our models and into our validation and verification. Robust observing capabilities. Obviously, we have extraordinary new developments with autonomous vehicles. And, and that's a given. I would argue that once you've got those systems, you can start talking about adaptive sampling. You can start talking about having pre-positioned platforms, as is being done right now, for example, by the National Science Foundation off the northwest coast to look at volcanic activity. So you've got underwater vehicles, you've got UUVs basically sitting there waiting for volcanic activity, 
and they can start sampling, communicating with each other, uh, and relocating as necessary as well. The adverse environments is clear. Uh, how are we going to start taking samples with the, the sort of dull, dirty, and dangerous aspect of making observations under the ice in the Arctic, as long as there is, as there is ice in the Arctic, uh, under the ice in the Antarctic, under the ice shelves down there. Uh, we at NOAA last year launched, for the first time ever, a small uh, drone into a hurricane so that it could penetrate the eye wall below 1,000 feet. We're not going to fly our P3s at 1,000 feet through the hurricane. The best part of that story is the drone itself made several penetrations, stayed in the eye wall for a while, and the last datum that it transmitted was sea surface temperature in the eye wall. I love it. It's great. That wasn't necessarily the plan, but it still was a good approach. Sensors, I talked about citizen science, obviously the affordable sensors. I, my hat's off to the uh, Schmidt Ocean Health X Prize competition for ocean acidification. Many of you have seen that. Two awards were given out a couple of months ago now for affordable and accurate pH sensors. It's a, it's a sensor technology that has not really been affordable of late. The best part of that story was the winning team came from Montana, that great coastal state. So now we're starting to see marine technology from, from all over the world. Real-time, accurate, precise sensors is obvious, easy, easy to use, unattended for extended time. But we live in a bad environment, a corrosive environment. Um, my colleagues at NASA are fond of pointing out what they're doing with Mars landers, and my hat's off to them. That really is an incredible technology. Now try doing it without RF transmission at 10,000 PSI, freezing temperatures in a corrosive environment. Oh, and keep it there for a long time and be able to bring it back. Uh, this is non-trivial, and I think we are our own worst enemies with respect to how we operate in the marine environment. At, as a card-carrying oceanographer, I can say that when I was an active researcher and I would propose an idea for a new sensor and my proposal would be rejected for cost, I was the first one to say, but wait, 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 I can probably do it for a tenth of that cost with some duct tape and bailing wire. And we get into that trap. Let's, let's be honest about what the costs are associated with doing this. And then platforms, yeah, next generation autonomous vehicles, you saw some great examples from the Admiral. Uh, now there's a lot of discussion about uh, multi-medium vehicles. Those can operate underwater, in the air. Uh, well, we demonstrated that with our Manta flying through the hurricane, so obviously. And it's probably still sent, uh, transmitting data right now from the bottom of the Atlantic somewhere. But there are some real opportunities with respect to the technology. There are opportunities with respect to big data. This sounds a little trite, but it's an important, it's an important concept in this economic development. So important that at NOAA, we've undertaken a big data project with five of the major cloud providers. And, and what we told them, our partners, the Googles and Microsofts and Amazons and cloud consortiums, we told them that basically we think, remember the slide that I showed with the three bubbles? We think there is a market there for those intermediaries because the end users want these products. But the problem is the intermediaries can't get to the data. We collect in NOAA 20 terabytes of data per day, and basically two of those 20 are easily accessible. How can we make the other 18, or whatever portion of the other 18 are needed, accessible to a broad community? This shows you the aggregate data holdings within, within uh, uh, NOAA, and, and it's including everything, satellites, radar, models, uh, fixed stations. So we're up to 24 petabytes. Um, and, and several of us on the staff said, that's great. Um, we have some concept of what a petabyte is, but most of our audience will not. So let's get, get this in terms of, of real terms. And so imagine taking your iPhone, placing it down on the table, then putting another one, a 64 gig iPhone, incidentally. It, it doesn't say that there, 64 gig iPhone. Stack them up so you get to the height of the Eiffel Tower, and then do that 15 more times. And that's what 24 petabytes of data represents. It's a lot of data. How do you handle that? How do you find the nuggets in that? How do you develop new products? That, to me, defines an economic opportunity. So how are we going to do all of this? 
There's a couple of aspects to it. I've talked about the creativity of the technological community. I've talked about public resources. I want to point out that many of you know NOAA is in the Department of Commerce. So I believe we have a responsibility, a commercial responsibility, to try to take advantage of the Economic Development Administration, the Small Business Administration, the International Trade uh, Administration, those components of NOAA that can help stimulate economic development. But there's another point here, and that is that we have to probably be a little bit more creative about how we're resourcing this. Right now, there are private benefactors. One of the most visible, obviously, is the Schmidt Ocean Institute, who are putting large sums of money into understanding this environment. How do we marry that up with this opportunity here? How do we compel those private benefactors that stimulating an economy like this and developing new products is worth doing. Crowdsourcing I talked about, that's a new resource, a new way of doing that. And I don't mean that in terms of Kickstarter going out to try to get 10,000 bucks to do an experiment. I'm talking about the data uh, collection aspect of it. There's also some very interesting discussions, and, and my hat's off to people like Congressman Sam Farr and Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, who have talked about the possibility of the federal government investing in something like an ARPA OA, Advanced Research Projects Agency for the Ocean and Atmosphere. That's a long way. That's a tough pull. But it's only going to happen if an audience like this makes the compelling arguments. And I think that the, the attitude for that or the palate or appetite for that is really quite strong right now. The important closing concept is that this market that I'm talking about really is global. Nothing that I've described. I've used U.S. examples throughout but it's not a U.S. specific kind of issue. This is a global economic opportunity. And the opportunity is very clearly oriented around service basis. Build on the current recognition of tangible product-based economy and use that same kind of algorithm to build a service economy. It's an information-dependent economy. We've never been as rich in the information about the ocean as we are right now. So bad on us if we don't exploit that, literally in the best interpretation, in terms of the economic opportunities. And the lifeblood of what I'm talking about here is that it's about predictions. And not all predictions are about the future, in spite of what Yogi Berra might have said. But I'm also talking about now casting. I'm talking about hind casting for forensic applications. I'm talking about long-term forecasting. I'm talking about short-term forecasting. These ideas are not really all that new. And our colleagues overseas, particularly in Europe, have made some great strides in developing this. So the Copernicus system, which is the evolution of the various forms of my ocean over the last few years, which is uh, run by Mercator, represent, and funded by the European Union, represents an extraordinary example of how to start taking these products. Copernicus represents the efforts of some 60 institutions throughout Europe. It's a really good example that we should look at, that we should try to build upon and expand upon in terms of public-private partnerships, in terms of economic opportunities, in terms of developing products. I love what's happening with Copernicus. It's just the tip of the iceberg, in my opinion in terms of new product development. So where are we going to be? Sometime in the future, in the new blue future, you'll have the kind of capability at looking at economic markets as broadly defined as investment in ocean catastrophe bonds. There are cat bonds right now. How can we help interpret the risk associated with ocean cat bonds? Ocean energy products in terms of siting, in terms of optimization of applications, and in terms of safety of operations, there is an economic market there. O ocean forecast derivatives, remember my example of the New Jersey Turnpike? Now start thinking about that in terms of commercial shipping. Start thinking about that in terms of the forecasts that might be used for recreational fishing. Start thinking about that in terms of public safety. Natural infrastructure management, every coastal community is going to want to have the best advice possible with respect to long-term investment in infrastructure. And, and we've gotten kind of gimmicky here to point out that 
we really should be talking about futures, ocean futures in each of these areas. And remember that in 20 years, we will have an opportunity to start accessing this kind of information using whatever, I guess that'll probably be about the iPhone 12 by then, we'll be using to access this kind of information. So in, in summary, I just want to point out, I think we are on this incredible cusp right now. I think this community is in the center of it. And I really believe that there is a thirst for a whole new class of products and services. And I hope that in a few years, as we meet in the oceans, we will be looking back on this conference as a seminal point that helped to define what this new blue economy looks like. Thank you very much. Do we have time? Yeah. I've been told we have time for questions, or comments, or criticism. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Kyle Patterson, and uh, we, I produce Sound Buoy for the Great Lakes State of Indiana. So, right. Bringing technology is infiltrated quietly. I do have a question. One of the issues that some of the people have addressed regularly, you mentioned it too, having the opportunity to set the flows on the oceans. How do you extricate data from the air forces? There are systems that are. Great. Thank you, Kyle. So Kyle's question from the great state of Indiana was, um, with these advances in platforms and sensors and an abundance and proliferation of these out in the open ocean, how will we uh, handle the exfiltration of data? It, in real time, I assume, was the sort of subtext of your question. Um, in light of some of the costs associated with that, it, it gets to... Uh, um, uh, the first question that was asked of the Admiral with respect to technology, I happen to believe, I've been in a number of briefings recently where I was pretty excited a few years ago when I heard about microsats, cubesats. Uh, we're now talking about uh, nanosats and picosats. And picosat is the size of the end of my finger here. Now, uh, space junk notwithstanding and the traffic patterns associated with that, what we are starting to see is very low energy data Mission. Not oriented towards our community so much, but obviously the intelligence community, uh, and there are a number of commercial markets associated with geospatial information which are taking advantage of that. So in much the same way that we look to Iridium or Service Argos or even the polar orbiters that, that are operated for weather purposes, there's a communication uh, niche data communication niche associated with the nanosat and picosat technology. And my prediction is that, I, I mean, there's one company right now out there that's saying that within just a few years you'll be able to get, I, I believe it was one meter resolution uh, uh, imagery updated on a daily basis for the full globe because there'll be so many of these satellites out there. That, that is phenomenal stuff, and, and the kind of stuff that I know makes the Admiral go apoplectic when you think about the security implications. But from a data uh, perspective, I think we'll be able to ride that trend for data access. Uh, there really is no other way to do it. There's some thoughts about using unmanned aerial vehicle, vehicles in local areas. Uh, that could be a solution as well with data relay kind of capabilities. I think that's a Band-Aid fix. I really think it's about the small sat uh, approach. Thank you for that question. Yes? Hi, Rick. Thank you for that presentation. I wonder if you have any advice for us as a community and how we ensure that there is a workforce that's available mm -hmm. to advance some of these opportunities that you present and also engage the public in participating in some of those crowdsourcing opportunities. So the question was really about workforce uh, development in light of what I've presented here, and, and again, I'm going to editorialize a little bit and believe that the subtext of that question is we are not educating the workforce necessarily right now to accommodate this sort of economic sector. Is that a fair additional point? Uh, we can do better. We can do better, okay. Um, I, interestingly, I just finished a, uh, a paper. It's been accepted for publication with a few of my colleagues. Some of you know Mel Briscoe, uh, Jim Yoder, who's a VP at Woods Hole, uh, Sue Roberts, who's the executive director of the Ocean Studies Board, and, and our argument was that the current educational system is not tuned to 
what I was talking about here. There are exceptions. University of Rhode Island has a blue MBA program in the Graduate School of Oceanography where they are teaching grad students about entrepreneurship, innovation. Um, I know when I went through graduate school, I couldn't spell IP, much less tell you what it was. Uh, so part of this is uh, changing the motivations within the graduate system, uh, changing the reward structure. Federal agencies can do that. Uh, I believe one of the things we could do in the federal agencies is put a little bit more emphasis on things like the Bayh-Dole Act, where research is actually required to be commercialized or an attempt made to commercialize or operationalize a piece of research. We don't tend to push that aspect of our grants and contracts programs. So I think the educational system needs to build a whole new set of reward structures. There need to be formal programs like the Blue MBA program. Um, and then I believe that there, the federal government needs to be a little bit more assiduous about uh, emphasizing the commercialization and oper operationalization of the research that we do support. Thank you. Yes? Hi, Todd. Great. So did you all hear that? Thursday morning, three papers by high school students that evoke some of the principles we've talked about here with respect to citizen science. <laughs> Thank you, Todd. Appreciate that. Yes, way in the back there. I, I'm having a hard time hearing. Can you yell, please? Yeah, so thank you very much. The question is really about strategic and proactive engagement at the national, local, community level uh, with everyone from emergency responders to local uh, jurisdiction oversight uh, to be prepared uh, and, and, and not necessarily wait for the events to respond. Am I characterizing your question appropriately? So uh, it, it's really a challenge. I think one of the things that has been particularly impressive over the last few years is that the federal agencies are getting out more. Uh, my boss and the FEMA administrator, for example, are having dialogues that I had never seen in my previous existence uh, at NOAA. And we are trying to take those discussions in the framework of resilience uh, to specific geographies. And we are using uh, the boots on the ground capabilities we have. Not as well as we could, so I'll give you a very specific example. Uh, we have Sea Grant, the National Sea Grant College Program throughout all of the coastal states. Uh, those folks, the Sea Grant agents and the Sea Grant College Programs, have uh, terrific connections with exactly the people you described, local emergency managers, local mayors, city councils, uh, county emergency uh, uh, folks. How can we take uh, groups like Sea Grant or extension agents, if we're talking about the Department of Agriculture, uh, and use them to advance the dialogue a little bit more? The other thing is one, one uh, very impressive thing that the White House has done of late is have a series of dialogues and discussions with those communities about what are the products that you need. Uh, there was a terrific discussion just four or five months ago with all of the tribes around the na uh, nation regarding uh, tribal-specific uh, problems and concerns, mostly related to climate change implications. So uh, part of my answer, and I'm having a hard time giving you a response with my hands in my pockets, part of the answer is an extended dialogue. The other part of the answer is recognition of the boots on the ground capabilities that the feds do have 
Um, and I, I think the other is building a, a mechanism where we are listening more to requirements-based product development. Within NOAA, I can tell you over the last year and a half that I've been back at NOAA, I have made the requirements-based mission alignment of our research activities job one, and we've published strategic research guidance along those lines. So there's a number of policy answers, boots on the ground answers, and, and I think that in, in short, time will tell as to whether those approaches are really paying off. But I would also argue we started doing a lot of that before Superstorm Sandy. I think the reduction in loss of lives, the reduction in uh, damaged property is in part a consequence of that dialogue. Even with the damage that was done in New York City, there were a lot of things done in preparation that wouldn't have happened, say, 20 years ago. Thank you very much. Yes, you're right in the light. can barely see you. So, so the basic question was, what are we doing about uh, translating the terrific science and technology and research and operational products to a more meaningful decision tool for the public, emergency managers, et cetera? The, um, the short answer is that um, it was very interesting for me. I retired from NOAA in 2010, came back in 2014, and the weather service is undergoing a major evolution, and one of the, at the core of that is uh, something we call IDSS, impact-based decision support systems. So it's no longer about, uh, gee, I'm going to convince you we've done a really good job by reducing the 500 millibar anomaly. You know, that doesn't really resonate with the emergency manager. But if I can give you a product that you can use more effectively, so for example, uh, we have a product uh, in the weather service called FACETS, and I'm, I can't get the acronym right, but it's basically a much more useful probabilistic forecast of the track of a storm. And what it does is it allows different users to put in their constraints. So for example, the track of a storm and how it is interpreted by the principal at an elementary school is going to be different from how it's interpreted by the administrator of a regional hospital. It's going to be different uh, by how it's interpreted by the National Guard in that area. And so being able to recognize those, those different boundary conditions and be able to say, I'm a high school principal, I'm going to look for this. I need uh, 12 hours notice. Uh, somebody else may, may be able to respond much more quickly. So we're recognizing that there isn't this sort of cookie cutter user community, but now we can tailor products accordingly. One caveat on that, and that's where the history of the weather service is one we need to take very carefully when we look at what I described here in my talk, and that is the public-private partnerships. There's been a lot of pr friction between commercial weather services and the National Weather Service. What constitutes going too far with the development of a publicly provided product and service? When are we, as civil servants, competing with the private sector? And there's been a lot of work developed to try to define where those lines are. So at the heart of your question also is, where do we turn and say, you know what? Your particular issue is one where you need to subscribe to a tailored product that can be provided by the private sector. And, and that's a discussion on the ocean side. Every example I gave is going to have to have that discussion as well. So hopefully I've gotten to a couple of the nuances of your particular question, but it's something we take very seriously in, in how we build the products that can be used by the private sector for uh, additional value add. Yes?
So the first thing I would say is that having worked as a civilian for Navy for most of my government career, um, uh, I came into this job with some sense of understanding of what Navy is working on. And the first thing I'd say is the dialogue between Navy and NOAA on issues like this is robust. Uh, that doesn't mean there can't be more dialogue. But your question was about the things that NOAA might be working on that could have value for Navy. And uh, I would argue that there are a number of experiments that we are conducting in the use of uh, surface, unmanned surface vehicles. You saw examples in Admiral Gallaudet's presentation. Navy is working on some of those same things. Uh, what we're doing is trying to use those for, uh, you can imagine using an unmanned surface vehicle for station keeping is a lot more cost effective than having a cabled uh, sensor in 4,000 meters of water or cabled uh, uh, buoy, fixed buoy. So uh, we have used some of those technologies with our tsunami warning system for data relay in both directions. We've shared our results in that with our colleagues at the Office of Naval Research, for example. I'll be going down to Nav Oceano here very shortly to try to address your specific question. I'm actually going down there mostly with my suitcase empty so I can come back with good stuff as opposed to me going down with a suitcase full of NOAA stuff. Um, but I think there's, there's a robust enough dialogue there. But the unmanned surface vehicles is a key part of it. When I talked about the relocatable and adaptable kind of uh, fleets of unmanned vehicles, one of the real uh, challenges for all of us is in the swarmed unmanned vehicle approach with adaptive sampling and adaptive data transmission because sometimes, yeah, you do want near real-time transmission. How are you going to do that? Got to have a surface vehicle up there. Uh, there's some very interesting work with uh, uh, microfiber optics as well, effectively disposable, uh, multi-kilometer length fiber optics for data transmission. That's another opportunity that we can pursue collectively as well. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions. Just cut me off, Rusty, when you want to cut me off. Yes. OK, and then I'll go over here. Yes. Great. Great. Thank you, Donna. That's why we have President Select, MTS. Yes, yes. Thank you, Dr. Sinrad. Um, my name is Amy Bernstein Rivera, and um, I'm hailing from um, MIT Woods Hole as an oceanographer. So I have the privilege to serve as a NOAA Sea Grant Fellow on the Hill. Um, I have a question about um, the important NOAA data products that you've been talking about as the basis of the economic opportunities that you've listed. And um, in the role of this community, Thank you, Whitney. So, Rusty, I have another two hours. Is that right? Okay. Um, let, me, let me address the sort of community international perspective. And if I've got your question right, how are we trying to stimulate the same kind of thinking through access to the information and products that an agency like NOAA has for international economic development? Is that what you're getting at? I was asking about continued government investment in the, um, in the data products. Ah. Continued government investment in data products, well, yeah, that's going to be driven largely by the mission. So don't forget, uh, all of the agencies, with the exception of the National Science Foundation and NASA in the federal government, are really mission-focused. NASA has kind of a quasi-mission focus, but we have to focus on the NOAA mission responsibility. So we will continue to develop data products, but not every data product that you want. It's going to be those that are uh, primary, primary for the mission 
priorities of the agency. And on one of my slides, I showed you what some of those are, community resilience evolving the weather service. Uh, those are examples of what we're trying to do. Um, and with respect to the valley of death, uh, I can proudly tell you that within NOAA, what I have done is stolen shamelessly from the best case examples at both DOD and NASA. So NOAA is on, in the process of developing a robust resource and process for what I call R2X, research to op uh, operations, research to applications, commercialization, utilization, and it involves applying a, the rigor of what NASA defined as the technology readiness levels, TRL. In NOAA, we will have readiness levels that parallel the NASA invention. And we are going to try to emulate the DOD 6.1 through 6.7 structure of funding so that we can effectively build a 6.4 account, which is for Navy a transition account. See, the Admiral has a responsibility and a capability to look what's coming out of the tech base at the Office of Naval Research and say, that needs to go into the fleet over here. We're building a resource to do the same thing. We're in the midst of trying to convince OMB and the Congress that this is the right way to do things. Um, and all responses thus far are very positive, and I'm hoping that within the next year I'll be able to say a little bit more about that. Thank you very much.